Hi, everyone. Welcome to our November meeting for the Free Press Book Club. Um, we're so happy to have you all here with us. It's getting cold, it's getting dark, it's getting close to holiday time, but we appreciate you spending uh, spending the evening with us tonight. Um, I'll just do our normal introductions before we get started. Um, of course, we have Ben Sigurdsson, the literary editor for the Winnipeg Free Press. We have Chris Hall, the co-owner of McNally Robinson. And we have our author, Welcome George Tolles, to joining us meeting for the Free Press Book Club. Um, we're so happy to have you all here with us. Do you hear that point? It's getting dark, it's getting close to holiday time, but oh my gosh, what's happening? Is somebody's somebody having playback uh, on their screen? Normal interactions before we get started. Um, of course, we have Ben Tickets, oh. the literary editor for the Winnipeg Free Press. Hang on a sec, let me we see if it's me. Hall, the co-owner of McNally Robinson. <laughs> it might be author, me. George Just Tolles, mute yourself, Ben, quick. Free Press Book Club. Um, we're so happy to have you all here with us. Oh, it's me. Oh, no. There we go. I'm sorry. Oh my gosh. Wow. Ben, we're like two years into this. I know. Uh, I know. Now I got to find I was sure it was me, though. I touched <laughs> off it. I've done it Not before, so I thought thing. it was me, but we got to figure it out. It's okay. Me. I'm very sorry, everyone. <laughs> um, before we get started, I'm going to do a, our land acknowledgement. So we are all gathering <laughs> on Treaty One territory tonight um, traditional lands of the Anishinaabe, the Cree, the Oji Cree, uh, and Dakota peoples, and also the homeland of the Metis Nation. Um, things will run as they always do. Ben will continue cowering in embarrassment in the corner for a little bit. Um, <laughs> we'll do our Q&A and then we'll talk a little bit about next month's pick, which is also for January because we are not meeting in December. This is our last meeting of 2021 somehow. So um, with that, I will throw to Chris and he will get things started for us. All right. Thank you, Aaron. It's, uh, I guess it has been almost a couple of years that we've been doing this and uh, we've read a lot of different kinds of books. On this journey, we've read lots of novels and uh, some short stories, essays, we've done some memoirs. And this month, we're going to tackle some microfiction in the form of some tiny stories in Status Update by George Tolles and illustrated by Cliff Island. Status updates are generally used on social media to offer an update on the current situation of the person posting. In this collection, these updates are used for something a little bit different. Nowhere do we get George Tolles' current situation, I don't think. Instead, we get little glimpses into fictional lives. Some are single sentence, barely a story at all, while even the longest is only several sentences. In them, we meet people like Beryl, who can meet no one to match the embraces she gave herself as a young girl, or a boy who doesn't realize that his imagined carnival rides are so much better than the carousel he can't afford to ride, Rex, who says sorry instead of sorry, so he ne never has to apologize to anyone, and God himself who makes an appearance and finally admits that he's never yet forgiven anyone for anything. And so many others. So these updates were posted daily beginning in 2009. And the project of daily updates is quite different than the collection before us tonight. The book is the best of collection of updates between 2009 and about 2013, as near as I can tell. Uh, with, and their dates are remixed. So our reading is different too. Rather than reading each post in daily isolation, we read them in rapid succession, or at least that's how I read them. Each story inevitably affects the others before and after, and that affects the whole reading experience. And this is before I even mention the illustrations provided by Cliff Island, which tempt us in a wholly different direction towards meaning. So what do we make of these collection of stories? That will be our assignment tonight, but luckily we have the author himself here to help us out. So to get us started, I'll hand things over to George Tolles to read from Status Update. Hello, everyone. Um, to reward those of you who have made it through the collection um, and might be bracing yourselves for repetition of things that you already <laughs> know too well, I'm going to read at least a few updates that have come Later, now, as Chris mentioned, the updates started. In fact, I just recently discovered it was no, November of 2008, and I haven't missed a day uh, since. So there, that means there are thousands of these things. Um, so, yeah, to give you not a, again, I, I don't feel that it's a kind of aesthetic evolution, but I do think that whatever an update is, it keeps metamorphosing uh, with a daily requirement that at least one be posted. And so I'll give you some that I feel convey different flavors of it. 
and then we can get down uh, to discussion. All right, just a second, yeah. The first one almost requires the title of its first three words, while Putnam slept. And Cliffy Eland wrote, did an, an art response to this, which was a red mailbox, um, just a vibrant red with some little embroidery on the side. So you can perhaps picture that as you listen. While Putnam slept, his cat walked across the Persian carpet in the study and then settled down on the window ledge. An improperly balanced book fell off his shelf. Rows of new ice cubes came into existence in his freezer. His parents in distant Kalamazoo had a serious argument but managed to make up. Some branches from his favorite oak broke off in a sudden windstorm. Creaks, rustles, reflections, and the lights and sounds of passing cars transpired. While Putnam slept, a secret love note, fervent but containing many misspellings, was placed in a red mailbox on a country road. Many people Putnam had never met breathed their last, often under mysterious circumstances. Putnam's neighbor, Mr. Yardley, went out to his tool shed to cry undetected. An inventor in Bremen got her artificial leg machine to do the French can-can. Anna Pitts, who had lost her memory, thought it was daytime and cleaned her house with immense satisfaction. A child who called himself Button stole some vegetables and walked 10 miles alone on the streets of Milwaukee. Throngs of other incidents took their natural and unnatural course under a canopy of starlight. Putnam awoke refreshed and in his ebullient mood, spared not an instant thought for anything he might have missed. Okay, so that's the first one. Christine had just arrived in Miami and she decided to take her first selfie to mark her vacation visit on a street corner near her hotel. As she was trying, trying to get the right I'm here expression to focus, she noticed a homeless man wrapped in a blue blanket lying next to her and watching what she was doing. With a reflex born of embarrassment and politeness, she said, hello. And then without knowing why, she took a photo of him. That action seemed to bring him to life. Let me see that, he said with a startling rasp. I can get rid of it, she replied. I should have asked your permission. Just let me see it. I want to see what I look like. She debated whether to run across the street or to do what he requested. Fear and a sense of having violated his privacy counseled her to make the conciliatory gesture. She stretched out her arm nervously and his face moved closer to the iPhone. Then with snake-like swiftness, he grabbed it away from her and shaking off his blanket, rose up and sped away from her. It was as though he had seized a vital organ. Movie memory let her yell, stop thief. And she instantly, desperately pursued him. There was no one nearby to assist her. She caught up with him in a breathless state and decided to grapple. You can't have that, you have no right. The claws of intensifying need pressed her forward. She seized his shirt. He had a powerful smell. He was barefoot and the skin of his feet were caked with dirt. She stomped on one of his feet and then to escape his tightening grip, she bit his ear and drew blood. But he proved stronger than she was and pushed her down hard on the pavement before sprinting off into an alleyway. Christine gasped and sobbed and gasped some more. In the distance, she heard a dog barking. 
She felt not only beaten, but naked without her iPhone connection to things. What now, what now, she said aloud, addressing the godless sky. She eventually walked back to the street corner where the incident took place and saw the blue blanket still lying there, dirty, torn, and bereft of its owner. It was bunched up in a heap and appeared helpless, like a supplicating child. She considered the possibility of his coming back to reclaim it. Should she wait? A nicely dressed couple was walking toward her from across the street, engaged in lively, pleasant talk. Nothing whatever had happened to them. She wanted to intrude upon their happiness and give them a solid dose of her victimization. She wanted someone to tell her what she should do. But more than that, she wanted, needed someone to explain what it all meant. All right. Uh, Few now from uh, Zabuk. Although Bruce's mother had been dead for six months, his daily phone calls to her had become no less acrimonious. She had added a calm, you put me here, to her long list of grievances, and there was simply no talking or shouting her way to reasonableness. I don't mean to alarm you, Bruce, but the consensus among my new acquaintances is that you are going to wind up in hell. I try to put in a good word, of course, but they're no fools. They know I'm neglected and how little you did for me when it might have made all the difference. Bruce couldn't stop pleading his case, but he detected a new coldness and distance in her manner. He felt like crying but tears had never made an impression on her. She would only laugh and call him Liberace. Yes. Norma was fond of saying, let me look at you. Sometimes she was trying to catch me in a lie, but more often her examination led her to spot something good in my face that was less visible to others. She regularly pulled what she called small treats for my brother and me out of one of her mysterious misshapen dark purses, but they never felt small because her emotional timing of treats was unerring. Norma told us on many occasions about Steve Linsler her first and, it was hard not to suspect, only real love. I asked him to wait for me a few more months. If he had, we would have been together, but he just couldn't wait. He was an impatient man. This Linsler was a China salesman, we learned, and that fact made him sound fragile as well as impatient. So he chose someone else but spent his too short life regretting his haste, I think, waiting for a second chance that was not to be. I like thinking about Steve Linsler and Norma hand in hand, trying to run back the way they came in the fading light to the beginning of their love. But love was running too, and it was too fast for them. They couldn't catch up. The gate when they arrived was shut tight and the leaves were still. And as I customarily do, I'm gonna wrap the reading with a, with a one which serves as the final one in the volume, which for reasons that may be obvious is among my favorites. To be misunderstood by someone you love is to feel like a child. To be humiliated or embarrassed is to feel like a child. To jump into a pool that's too cold is to feel like a child. And so it is for other things. To make mistakes, to not remember the answer, to have a joke fall flat, to toss and turn at night in fear, to lose one's way, to be caught up in a book, to roast marshmallows, to have gorged on food, to spy on a neighbor or coworker, 
And of course, to be dying is to feel like a child. All right, so. George, thank you so much for that. That was fantastic. I promise not to have any more technical difficulties at, in, in my control, at least. That was, that was horrible. I had, a, I had a window open because I was leaving a link for someone who wanted to watch the, uh, the video perhaps afterwards. And so I, had, I guess I had inadvertently left it open. Anyway. No, no apologies required. I, I have a technical mishap almost every three minutes of my um, yeah. well, line of life. <laughs> You and me both, and so the echo, the Aaron Labar echo chamber is is closed now, and so we can we can move on. Um, thank you for that. That was that was fantastic, and I was sort of hoping you would you would throw in some 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 new ones or whatever, for lack of a better term. Um, before we sort of dive into the book too much, do you want to talk a little bit about Cliff? I mean, uh, the kind of person he was, how you came to connect, and oh, and oh. when he started working um, on on art with you to sort of go with your some of your status updates. Well, um, Cliff was married to Pam um, Perkins, who was in our English department, and that's how we met. Uh, and, well, I don't know, it, it, it's so difficult to describe the utterly singular individual that Cliff was with a few broad strokes. Um, what I've often said is the, that he is the nearest equivalent, I mean, to Peter Pan minus the vanity that I've ever, that I've ever known. I mean, that he has uh, this enviable, um, childlike openness, freedom, a sense of there being really nothing to repress, almost nothing to be afraid of, though he, was contending with illness for a great many years. Um, he was extraordinarily generous to all of his artist friends. When I first knew him, he was in the habit of doing something I gather that he'd started a number of years ago. He would uh, secretly deposit works of art between the pages of books in my library with the hope, I guess, that at some point I'll be reading casually through and there it is um, from some undisclosed time uh, of, of a long ago visit. Um, Cliff, in some ways, it was, I, I think, a perfect pairing for me because his so much of his art was the size of, of library file index cards. And interestingly, the, I think the, maybe the first nudge or tug toward status update as a form was my memory of my aunt's postcards, which were exactly the same size, uh, to my mother and her mother and my aunt, uh, my other aunt, which she faithfully wrote every week. And she managed to get so much stuff in her perfect handwriting on these little cards. And this notion of a, of a card not be, um, being an almost boundless expanse um, struck home for me early on. And I think there, for whatever reason, uh, Cliff was completely at home in the, the small frame of the library index card rectangle. Now, again, so many artists, uh, rather, and other collaborators were recipients of Cliff's largesse. Uh, in my case, after I'd been doing these for a couple of years, uh, over breakfast one weekend, he said, you know, I think I'd like to do some responses to a few of these, if you don't mind, uh, would, that, uh, would that interfere and maybe post them? And I said, are you kidding? I would be uh, deeply honored and uh, delighted if, if you were to do that. So uh, he did a few. And then the next week he said, you know, I think I'd like to do a lot more. <laughs> he said, would you mind if I went back to the beginning of your updates at the end of 2008 and did illustrations for, or rather our responses for all of them 
that you've written so far. And I'll keep going with the ones you do each day and we'll see, we'll see how it goes. And so until the end of 2013, uh, he was producing with a fine frenzy of creative inspiration uh, responses that wonderfully never, the, the one suggestion I made to him, and we rarely talked about uh, how we should proceed, um, was I said, I don't want them to be illustrations of the text. I don't want it to be a, an imitation of what's there. I want it to be in dialogue with it, but give it, give the, the reader someplace else to go. And that suited him down to the ground. And so um, he kept creating these marvelous uh, pieces, uh, a small batch of which, of course, are gathered together in, in the volume. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, and there's going to be a, thankfully, a, a Cliff Eland exhibit uh, the end of this year, beginning of next year at the Winnipeg Art Gallery. In addition, of course, to his extraordinary uh, project at the Winnipeg Centennial Library and the even bigger one um, in Halifax. Well, I'm so, so thrilled that our friendship is in a sense tied together by this, this wonderful gift that he gave me. That's fantastic. Um, and so <clears throat> did you ever find that his art responses uh, to your updates sort of made you think about you, uh, what you had written sort of in a, in a different way or interpreted? Almost, or almost approached? always. I yeah. mean, I, the thing, I mean, what I love about Cliff's bodies and faces that they seem to be like cinematic superimpositions. You've got three or four different expressions within these these labyrinths and faces competing for ascendancy. I mean, they're, but they're all um, present somehow in, in a kind of, and, and I, I love the way it suggests how that the flicker effect in human, the human face as it goes uh, rapidly and unconsciously from one thing to another and trying to settle in, but not having to. And I think um, the, the, it's the fact that you can play with the drawing uh, for a, a good spell and then perhaps coming refreshed back to a second reading and, and maybe having a different mood emerge from that doubling. Yeah. Um, it, it's, it's an interesting book to unpack as a book club because it is, yeah, there's no traditional sort of narrative all the way through. There's no traditional protagonist that runs through the piece. There's snapshots right. and visuals, smaller moments. Yeah. Um, you know, if you know, you read one, you sort of t you take in the, the the visuals. You sort of take a breath and move on to the next one. Mm -hmm. um, but it does have this feel, and and that I've heard sort of writers talk about before. You know, they they say, oh, you know, I'm a, I'm a great observer of people. You know, I really sort of like I see people, I soak it in. You know, I sort of yeah. absorb those things. Um, are you, do you sort of operate in the same manner where you know you're out in the world and you see people and you're absorbing sort of their yeah, mannerisms, well, what they're doing? Well, it took a while, of course, for me to figure out what an update was. I felt, I mean, although I was operating, as I'd like to say, in the sub-sub basement of liber literary expression, Facebook, um, the, the, nonetheless, uh, there seemed to me at least the possibility of, of creating a genre um, within this, I mean, without, without, putting any advanced notions. Of course, as, as Chris said, it's microfiction. There's lots of examples of short pieces. I'm sure I've been influenced by Robert Walzer and to a certain degree and by Lydia Davis and others and thinking about, well, the brevity, but really uh, one thing that I very much wanted to do when I was still in the sorting phase and which is, continued uh, ever since is to have as much day-to-day um, -day 
difference as possible. I mean, the, the, the notion of the productive clash or friction. I mean, it's a, you, you, you feel, well, this is solidified and creates a tiny little world unto itself. And then I, I would say that the following day, I would like to do something that would unravel that. And I mean, and make something um, that is, asserts itself equally strongly, but in a different dimension. Now, Thomas, my son is the editor of this volume and I have to applaud him again for the the gigantic task of selecting a group of a hundred from the 1750 that were given to him with illustration, with art responses rather. Is it just like and a big pile? A big pile. And, and I mean, Thomas is, a, let's say a patient reader of my stuff. I mean, he knows it well and he knows me well, but really I think that uh, for all of, I said, please preserve, I said, I don't want this to be, theme-centered and over-organized. I said, I want that serendipity element uh, to be retained in the book. Uh, but Thomas, I think in his, not just in his selection, but in his placement uh, was creating a, a not quite, it's not a declared structure, but it seems to me that there is a, a hidden relationship among pieces that it made at first um, seem to have little in common. And, and so I, I think as one goes along, perhaps the, the form of the whole, it's not something you could specify or, or work out, it's nonetheless uh, emerging. And uh, it, if that's the case, it is entirely Thomas's doing. Uh, but in terms of the day-to-day Uncertainty. I mean, you commit to something and you, it's like, um, I try to just keep the mind <laughs> in the shower a kind of as, as receptive and unanxious as possible and see if a word comes up or a phrase from yesterday's conversation or or the beginnings of a story, but trying not to overthink it before. It be, I mean, that the real drafting excitement comes from not knowing in advance and having to really earn an ending that isn't there bef before I begin. I hope that sort of answers the, the question. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it sort of and it sort of brings up a few other questions that I had as well. What sort of one being, you know of Thomas's selections, did you then sort of look at, at what he had curated and sort of go, no, 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 you know, like, I, I, I really, I don't want that. Or is it, was it all him? It's all him. I said, okay. I, I, I had absolute, I had a few regrets that certain things didn't make it, but I wanted Thomas to truly have a free hand. And, and really since my own, thoughts about this thing as a book was were just so stymied. I mean, there were just so many things that were, uh, well, why not this? And why not this? And I, I, I gave the editorial selection entirely to him. And I mean, but really going through it, there was no place where I felt, oh, I don't want this in the book. So it was mm -hmm. not, a, I mean, if that had been the case, I would have uh, spoken up, but I, mm -hmm. again, um, um, he is the ideal reader. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that, that's fantastic. Um, and, uh, oh, I had a follow-up question to this. Um, do you ever, okay, so like the one thing about Facebook is that it's <clears throat> got this, um, this feature called memories where, you know, you can see what you posted on this day, two years ago, on this day, three right. years ago. And that seems like something that you sort of- um, I regularly consult. Yes. And I also have files for everything that I've done. So Facebook has been uh, unreliable in its memory gathering in <laughs> recent years. Though they, they just arbitrarily wipe out, say, what you did in 2020 or 2018. And so I, I'm, that instantly makes me curious. I mean, to go to the file and see well, what might that have been. But it, in, I guess the last couple of years I've been doing a, in addition to the, the, the new one or more, 
I never do more than three, but there have been days when there have been three. I post three, two or three favorites from the memory pool to, um, to give people who didn't see them the first time around. Uh, and if they're really bored over coffee, <laughs> I mean, and, and, um, and, and some of them, have been favorites for large numbers of people. So I try to include some of those as well. Um, and it's impossible to say what the exact daily size of the readership is. I think it, it varies, but um, thankfully enough people click on things to make me feel that I'm not only speaking to myself and, so, and really it, it's been great to, to have something that's like working in a newspaper to, to be forced well, by self-discipline to create something each and every day. And then if it's perfect or imperfect, you've done the best you could and, and you post it. And it's, I just think it is, it's loosened up in a, in a very good way my writing in other areas. So um, without, without, of course, my wanting to be sloppy or half-assed, I mean, if you, but it really, I never allow myself more than an hour um, to work on the update. Otherwise it's gonna be an all day, day pro problem soon. So, mm -hmm. so, that's a, so, that's a, so that's a self imposed time limit. Yeah, well, it's a did parts of what you said. It's all, like you're almost living in my head. The part, especially the parts about the newspaper. I did find um, uh, uh, one of the the you know sort of previous updates that you posted today from from last year. I thought was just like it was like just such a, a beautiful uh, beautiful piece. Um, and it actually did bring in you know um, it was about Ruth being reunited with her husband Owen. Um, yeah. um, I, I won't read the whole thing, although I did print it off in the with the intent of possibly. Like this, if you wanted to read any of it or ask me about any of it. Um. Uh, no, I don't really have anything to ask except for the fact that like, uh, I guess in this one, you do mention like, you know, something about a mask comes up, something about COVID. Did that sort of change the yes. dynamic of anything? Yeah, like? there's a lot of, there's a lot of COVID uh, inflection uh, since, well, let's say, um, March of 2020. 2020. So mm -hmm. let me just read one short one, which is which is definitely a COVID piece from that very month, March 2020. As far as he could remember, Arthur had never felt safe. He was habitually prone to dwell with fearfulness on the many ways that random misfortune, a swift saber thrust from contingency could arrive without any warning and do him in. With the onset of the massive new health crisis, it seemed that the dangers encircling every life were now generally visible. No one seemed insulated anymore from the awareness of life's extraordinary fragility. A peculiar consequence of this unmasking of the ever-present hazards of being was that Arthur found himself increasingly calm, happy, and free. He seemed joined to others more naturally and truthfully. Those around him expended less effort in concealing and denying their core vulnerability. He shed the burden of his imagined difference. Every strand of connection he attained in his passing encounters with people, animals, and helplessly expressive objects made him feel a more radical sense of exposed belonging to something vast. A young woman he had never seen before held open a door for him as he went into his apartment building. He came close to choking up as he thanked her for the kind, by no means small gesture. So, I mean, I think that sort of, it doesn't cover the waterfront, but it indicates, I mean, trying to absorb the new state of affairs and without constantly mentioning masks making those psychic conditions of covid part of the part of the storytelling mm -hmm. um, um chris uh aaron do you want to jump in with anything either of you um i'm, I'm content sure, I, um, 
I've uh, stopped my video. I'm, I'm coming at you from a hotel room in Saskatoon, and so the Wi-Fi isn't quite uh, up to my standards. But I I'm take so it so used to the to these black boxes from <laughs> teaching. <laughs> I see. Yes. I'm turned on camera. Who's behind there? Is anyone there at all? I assure you, I've been paying attention. Yeah. Um, the uh, I, I'm curious because the like each little story is. Um, Many of them build an entire world in it, and I yeah. kind of use the word "tempt" in my in my introduction because then Cliff's illustrations tempt me further. Like, like I'm tempted towards these huge worlds, and I'm just wondering, like, are you tempted by any of them to to get back to them and work them into something bigger or longer? Um, or? Not so far. Um, mm -hmm. I'm. I before writing updates, I did a number of screenplays, which is, a, I mean, I, I know a number of people take screenwriting at least somewhat seriously as a form. I never regarded it quite that way. In fact, I, I, I see screenwriting as being at the service of a director and creating a sandbox for um, things to to be tried out and, but in bits and pieces um, that I guess working, I guess what I'm trying to say is that um, when you try something like a novel, at least I've been reading uh, incessantly from a very early age and I'm well aware of the towering masterpieces uh, oh. that have, preceded my venturing into the writing life. And frankly, those big forms, I mean, being in a kind of not chosen, but almost uh, felt competition and feeling oh, falling so drastically short of the books that I care about. I, I, just, I just could not do that. And also the idea of seeing um, small things that manage to do something fairly big, uh, but in one shot without feeling obliged to continue, there's something very gratifying to me. It just suits my nature. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the fact that I can let not just uh, an idea or a mood or emotion go, but a whole world go and start from scratch again. This, I, it, that works for me. Now maybe, maybe I've, I've, I've dreamed over the years of having an idea for a play that, I, that won't let me alone and, and just working that out. But so far that idea hasn't materialized. And so, um, Essays, these sorts of things, letters. Um, that's my that's my beat. Well, I, I have to think that there's a lot of authors out there, especially those suffering from writer's block, that that look at you and the number of stories you come up with and think, "Holy smokes, give me one!" <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it's nice to. I mean, um, you can always do a variation on something you've done. I mean, but, it, but it's also the idea of the, the pleasure of at least trying not to re repeat yourself uh, mm -hmm. and trusting your memory not to allow you to do exactly what you did uh, last year on the same day or five years ago. I mean, that, 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 uh, but also, yeah, I mean, the, the, the notion that, there can be a prodigious amount of story making um, without the felt requirement of uh, a, a giant or medium sized narrative. I mean, to, I mean, to work through in with nuts and bolts precision all those transitions and holding everything. No, I mean, I, I just, I cond condensation is, is, the, is the demand and also the pleasure. But yeah, anyway, thanks. Well, I was thinking the, uh, like years ago, I read uh, some thinking about even uh, 
if we string three words together as humans, our brains are just they, we want to start that's right. know, connecting those and, and that's right. building a story out of it. And I, I was reminded of that as I read yours. It, it's, well, one it's, of the things I tell my students um, that it, it seems strange to me that there's no teaching of the imagination at any level. Um, there are no college courses in it. There's no high school course in it. And yet it seems to me to be after love, the second best thing we've got. And it's not something uh, that naturally persists. It requires exercise and consideration, but empathy and everything else, it seemed to me for exist within the domain of the imagination and the romantic poets and others, I think had it essentially right that it's a kind of godlike power. I mean, that's present in everyone, uh, but, but, but you can, I mean, to, to imagine that grown-ups so often tell their children that, um, I mean, once you're 10, you're too old for Santa Claus and your imagination. <laughs> Uh, get rid of all of that and turn your turn your attention to reality, however miserable I keep telling you it is, kids. Um, that's all. I mean, it's reality. Imagination is make believe. Uh, yikes. Anyway, uh, are there? I wonder if there are questions. If there are listeners who have any. Yes, Aaron. Uh, do you have any questions if you'd like to jump in with yeah, from list or from viewers, listeners, readers, whatever? Yeah, we had a few submitted ahead of time from readers, but we've actually answered most of them. I know, I know. I was noticing that too. Yeah. Um, uh, one was, what inspires these random odd pieces of writing? Um, what do you read? What do you? Yeah. What do you read? I read um, primarily. I read fiction. Um, theater texts, um, some memoirs, some biographies, uh, a lot of film criticism, um, a great book, which has probably come up already that I would recommend to anyone with creative writing uh, interest is George Saunders, A Swim in a Pond in the Rain in which four Russians give a master class on writing, reading, and life. I just think he, he just does a brilliant job of not just talking about the writing process, but reading these stories and showing you how they're put together. And each of the stories is wonderful. And Saunders is himself a great fiction writer. And he has such a, a beautifully modest approach uh, to craft questions. Um, I don't know. It's, and it's funny in addition to everything else. It's, it's, uh, yeah. Well, let's see. What am I reading right now? I'm reading Javier Maria's The Man of Feeling again. Um, I just finished Marilyn Robinson's Jack. Um, I'm reading, um, oh, the new Jonathan Franzen. Crossroads, which seems to me far and away his best book since the corrections. I mean, I've been waiting for him to rise up to that level again. And, and he, he certainly has, um, let's see, I'm, well, anyway, I don't want to um, spend too much time in the current, uh, the, that new collection of short stories that won the Giller Prize, How to Pronounce Knife, I just finished that. Um, I'm afraid I mispronounced the author's name, the Laotian writer, uh, but that's a very promising book. And she's ex an excellent poet as well. Um, anyway, so. Um, I, I, would, I would venture to say that uh, George Saunders is, uh, has uh, imagination that re would remind me of you that- uh, well, yeah, I, like there's a surprise when I'm when I'm reading him that he doesn't do this microfiction or that I've read at least, but but I'm just never sure what he's going to do next. Or yes, well, he, he no, I mean, there, truth be told, there aren't a lot of writers that make me laugh. Um, I mean, I wish there were more. I mean, great writers. I mean, I'm not talking about uh, stand-up comedians, but I mean, Charles Portis, George Saunders, Fl Flannery O'Connor. Um, Let's see, Javier Maria. Some sometimes, um, 
of Dickens, but um, it, it's strange that, and Franzen's actually very funny, uh, but I mean, given the the huge number of writers, Italo Calvino, I mean, the huge number of writers that I'm um, going through, it, it's, it's, it's a regret that there aren't maybe more writers who can blend comedy in without uh, ceasing, of course, to have serious objectives as well. And so those writers who manage to make comedy uh, a volatile, essential component are, are ones that I uh, gravitate toward and probably revere. Yeah, it is a bit rare. I, we get asked at the store uh, for something in literature that's funny. And I remember the first time that happened, <laughs> I, I was so surprised because it, it's hard. It's hard to find that combination. Yeah. Have you tried Gary Steingart? I was yeah. just going to say that. Yeah, Steingart for okay. sure. And of course, Jane Austen. How could I admit? I was, I was uh, honestly, Chris, I was, I was trying to get a word in edgewise because I said, I just, <laughs> I was going to say, I just finished the new Gary Steingart, Our Country Friends, which is like, it's got the pandemic in the background about yeah. these people who sort of go away to this, you know, right. rural New or rural New York retreat and sort of wait it out or whatever. But I, I actually thought, okay, well, I, I'm not going to get into this because I'll email George about it later. <laughs> Steingart for sure. Yes. I, I had to recommend a book before I, before, uh, you know, that's just what I do. Yeah. Anyway, um, uh, Aaron, I, well, I know we did have one question about a specific um, entry. Yes. I don't know how, how easy it is to sort of dive back into a status update that's almost. I can, a I can either remember or, or, enjoyably so, make up. Um, uh, the question is, does the story about Norris on page 50 have a personal meaning? Oh, because it's, because there's a, well, it's sort of, it's sort of almost about status updates. I think yeah. I, that would be my interpretation. I would, I would definitely say that that, that would be my, my answer as well. Now, the, one of the ones that I read today um, about, uh, Steve Linsler, um, who be, has become a China salesman, and this, the woman, the woman in that story is based on my grandmother, uh, and she did have a person that she loved named Steve Linsler, who she didn't marry for religious reasons, and I mean all of the, I mean, and there was this great wistful regret whenever she brought him up, and so uh, so that was kind of this this the seed for this and i and although <clears throat> this conversation never happened I, it helped me to imagine my brother and myself sitting there listening to my grandmother talking about him so yes i mean the nice thing about rarely using the word i is that you can conceal the autobiographical dimensions um as much as you like, and people need never know. And then also you don't feel that you need to be scrupulously accurate. I mean, if, I mean, one of the possible difficulties of autofiction is that you're constantly forcing the reader to ask the question, well, is this literally the case or is this a stretch and it's she or he moving um, into, um, um, satiric overdrive now with this particular person, or I mean, anyway, if it, it, if you if you remove the um, you can't, I, I guess, entirely remove the guesswork, but at least the 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 clear profession of autobiographical uh, concerns. It. it it allows you to, well, move in just about any direction, a, a, little, a little less encumbered, I find. Um, and also, it's something about when you've told a story that exactly corresponds to something that's happened, I often think you're draining the well, um, that you, you, you want to, you don't want to, 
It's because once a, once a memory has truly turned into a, sh a story that satisfies you, the story replaces the memory. And so the memory is no longer there in its own way as a prod of, of, with different kinds of valence to it. I mean, it, um, so yeah, I, I'd like to feel that I take things that are fragments and bits and combine them with other things rather than, let's say, use up the best the best times um, that are there, of course, is the, is the, let's say, the image center. For, I mean, Kamu once said that writers spend their whole lives um, going around and around the image or images in whose presence their hearts first open. And whether that's true or not, it seems beautiful and, and suggestive to me. Totally. So, um, we, oh, sorry. Sorry. So, no, go ahead. In auto fiction, George, you, you don't use the word I, but you do use the name George. So, yeah. I noticed that, that as well. Winking? Yes, George. Well, Thomas picked out the two uses of George. Um, every once in a while, um, I say, well, what? Why am I avoiding my name? <laughs> and, I, and again, I'm, I think I'm the sixth George in a row in my family. So um, there are all sorts of Georges um, in the kinship pile. <laughs> but no, sometimes, sometimes, once in a while, I mean, I, I did, I frequently do ghost visits from parents, especially my dad. And in those stories, I'm perhaps a little more tempted to fess up. It's, it's George or Sonny, as my nickname was, who's having this encounter with um, an always surprising father when he, when he comes back for another inning. Um, so um, we're just sort of, I think we're just sort of getting to the end of our, our, our time, George, um, but I'd be remiss if I didn't ask sort of, are, are you, I, I did notice in the book that uh, it, it did mention something about a second volume. Is that, is that in fact, um, or well, is there it, anything Catherine, else you're working Catherine on? Catherine Lee out in, in British Columbia was working for some time on uh, a, a second collection. I, it, it may have stalled right now. There's no immediate plans for one, um, but I'm, I'm, I mean, given <clears throat> if there's a readership and a willing editor, um, I mean, rather a willing publisher, um, it would be, I would want there to be art again. Um, but of course, the stuff since 2013, Cliff didn't have an opportunity to do anything with. We'll see. I mean, the, the, the forthcoming or the second volume, it's, that, that was, I think, rather wishful speculation rather than a confident. Well, it, 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 wishful. Might, it, might wait, it might well happen. No. I mean, there's certainly, there's certainly enough material. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, wishful on my part as well, for sure. I'd love to. I'd love to read uh, and see more of them, sort of in conjunction with with more art. Is there anything else you're you're working on right now, George? Um, well, I published very recently a, a a book of film criticism called Curtains of Light, which has just come out in paperback, uh, for, with from SUNY Press, and it's about the it's a number of essays on theatrical space and film. And I'm happy with the book. And if people like film criticism that's readable and deals with questions, I think that, and great films that they might be familiar with, um, a possible Christmas gift. And I've, I'm, <laughs> writing, <laughs> I'm writing a lot of, uh, individual essays on film and literature still and I guess that and I do I do script consulting still and I love directing plays if that ever becomes possible again and maybe that play I mentioned earlier will 
scratch its way out of the earth in which it lies buried. Or you, you said that your new book was out in paperback. Is that true? Or is, I thought it was it just in hardcover. Well, it, it came out initially in hardcover. This is what oh. university presses do. Yeah. Uh, the, the first run is prohibitively expensive, except there's Kindle and then there's that. And then certain presses, if they feel a book has got maybe for academic, by academic standards, legs they do a paperback edition and this one is due out within a month or so so pre-orders are now accepted and it's and it's certainly vastly less expensive than the hardcover well i'm sure you're probably uh yeah i know you've written a book on call tom sanderson as well i'm sure you're probably chomping at the bit to uh, oh my goodness one. yeah i mean my my one worry about the paul thomas anderson reviews are everyone seems to like it <laughs> Which, of course, is on the one hand, oh, thank goodness for him. And it does sound wonderful. But um, uh, one of the pleasures, of course, of, of his other films is that they, in a good way, tend to divide audiences. I mean, he's a demanding filmmaker. And this notion, I, I doubt that it will be um, a film that has, I mean... Uh, insufficient ambition. I mean, but I mean, it, it sounds completely delightful, but, it, but it, it's just that, that sense that there, there's no one out there who's yet that I've read who is down on the film and virtually every other movie that he's made has, has divided the pack. So we'll, we'll see. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm, I'm thrilled about the prospect of seeing it. I guess it'll arrive in Canada somewhere close to the new year yeah who knows anyway and the film for people who don't know is called licorice pizza which is uh yeah. by paul thomas anderson a record um, store apparently and he's yes it's returning to san fernando valley the, yes the place and obsession of his mm -hmm. life <laughs> anyway george it's been a, i mean uh, as a speaking as a former student of yours and i know aaron was as well um you know like i could listen to you talk all night and and taking courses with you uh, you know, enhanced my love of reading and my love of film in ways that are immeasurable and, and yeah, that just sort of were, were totally paradigm shifting. So it was great to be able to talk to you. And it was really, so really much. I hope there were at least enough spectators out there to make it worth your while. Yeah. I, I, oh, absolutely. I, I, and, yeah. and, and, you know, other than, you know, updating my, my parents with, with pictures of my kids, your status updates are pretty much the only reason I keep Facebook around. So <laughs> you didn't mention the toxicity of Facebook. So let's end with that. <laughs> Positive. And then a positive. Exactly. Um, before we go, we're going to talk quickly about our next book, which is Moon of the Crested Snow by Wabgesha Rice. Um, Wob, you may recognize his name. He was a journalist with CBC Manitoba for a number of years, I think like around 2006-ish. Um, so he's a super talented journalist, a super talented writer. He's going to be joining us for our January meeting. This is your second reminder that we do not have a meeting in December um, because it's holiday time and everyone's busy. Um, so we will be meeting for this in January. And that's, that's it. That's it for the night. That's it for the year. Um, on behalf of everyone at the book club, we want to thank you all for, for joining us tonight and, and all of the book clubs previously. It's been such a great year and we really appreciate all the support always. So have a great holiday season. Um, stay safe, stay healthy, and we will see you in 2022. An early happy new year to everyone. <laughs> yes. yes. And of course, thank you, Ben, for hosting and George. Thank you so much for your time and Chris for joining us from Saskatoon. Really? Yes. Saskatoon. Okay. Looks a lot right. like Grant Park McNally behind <laughs> it. <laughs> All right. Good night, everybody. Yeah.